Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining. Um, today we're going to have our uh, Peter Guru, who is our um, product development engineer. He's going to be talking about uh, beyond probes, engineering your experiments. So, so things that uh, we can do engineer wise to make, um, make your experiment easier and more robust. Um, he's going to be giving some examples and giving you some ideas and as always, you can feel free to customize beyond his ideas to make it easier for yourself. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, everybody. Let me share my screen really quick. Okay, so this presentation is really gonna, oh, real quick, I'm Peter Giro. Um, I'm the resident product engineer here at NeuroNexus. And um, this presentation is really going to center around two topics. That's microdrives and chambers. Um, that's going to depend a lot on what size animal model you're working with. And um, let's get started. So like I said, two halves, really um, pretty parallel. It's going to be an overview of different technologies that we offer and different ways that you can customize them. And then we'll have a few minutes for Q and A at the end. So save all those tricky technical questions for the last few minutes. So first off, micro drives. And in an EFIS context, um, when we talk about a micro drive, we're talking about any kind of device that's used for positioning or adjusting the depth of a recording electrode. So, this is the point, if you have an electrode picked out, um, maybe take a few minutes to go through our catalog. We have a ton of different site layouts, different options. If you have an electrode picked out, but you're not quite sure what to do with it, how to get it in place, how to make use of it, um, this is probably like the most basic option we offer. So a micro drive really has three core components here. Um, the first is gonna be the drive itself. And that's really just a very miniaturized lead screw in a biocompatible plastic housing. Um, next, obviously the most important functional component is going to be the electrode and the connector package, which again, if you haven't checked out our probe catalog, um, it's a great time to do that. We have a ton of different options, different site layouts, different site materials, different shank spacings, um, very customizable. And then next is gonna be a protective cap. So this is all meant to be cemented in place, uh, just held in place with a combination of bone screws and bone cement. So the first thing would be cementing the drive in place. And then once your crani craniotomy is closed, the protective cap is cemented in place over top of it. Um, I also wanna just brush up briefly on some of NeuroNexus standard microdrive offerings. Um, if you don't need to customize, I mean, we have a couple different options available, um, and those are really separated by drive length and whether or not you're doing optogenetics. So from left to right is gonna be increasing drive range, and then the top row is our standard D drives. Those are our disposable optogen or our disposable EFIS drives, and the bottom row is gonna be our O drives, our optogenetics drives. So I think these all weigh under one gram. Um, I'm not sure about the two O drives. I know they are a little heavier with the opto components, but I know the D drives for sure all weigh sub one gram. So this is kind of our selection criteria or whether or not a micro drive would be a good fit for you. Um, if you're just getting started or maybe you're moving from wire electrodes, you wanna give silicon electrodes a shot, um, a microdrive is a really inexpensive way to get started in this world. It's a really inexpensive way to position electrode and use it with a small animal model. Um, and kind of in that same vein, they are very lightweight. They are meant for small animals. They're really slimmed down. They're thin little biocompatible plastic pieces. And they are all 3D printed, so that makes them very easy to mass produce. There's no tooling, there's no injection molding. Um, we can run a tray, we can crank out hundreds of these drives in one time. If you have some large trial that you're trying to do on dozens of animals, 
we can give them all equivalent implants that you can just drop in place on the skull. Now the downside to that is because they are intended to be on small animals only, they are relatively fragile. Um, this is not something you want to put on any kind of non-human primate or any animal with a lot of like, neck strength or upper body strength to like, grab at an implant or swipe anything off the top of their head. And again, they are one of the reasons that they're priced so inexpensive is they are not intended to be reused. Um, it is pretty difficult as it is. It's a, it's a losing proposition to try and harvest one of these off of an animal at the end of an experiment. Um, the electrodes themselves probably won't survive like the chipping away bone cement process. So it's just, again, they're, they're priced competitively because they're intended to be single use. So, as I mentioned before, this is, if you're thinking about getting into the space and you're not sure whether or not a microdrive is right for you, we're going to go through a few of the use cases or criteria to think about. Um, again, the biggest one is going to be animal model. If you're doing large animals, these are really not for you. They're just simply not robust enough, not rugged enough. If you're doing mice or rats, these are a great option. Um, they're also great for our long-term EFIS experiments. So a really common use case for this is if you want to do an implant, drop an electrode in place, and then slowly advance to your target depth over the course of several days or several weeks, or if you're planning on doing a very long recording experiment. Um, if you need like weeks or months of data, if you start to lose like, signal integrity or signal fidelity, um, that can be due to another a number of things. A big one is like histological reaction to the electrode itself. So a common use case is for people to um, advance the probe over time as they start to use as they start to lose um, signal fidelity down to fresh neurons, or even to retract it a little bit and advance it again, retract and advance and try and break any glial buildup or anything, break that loose off of the probe. Again, I mentioned this before, but a big advantage here is repeatability across numerous subjects. So if you have a ton of mice or a ton of rats, you're trying to do a, a big trial, big study across a dozen animals, this is a really easy way to do that. We can print out uh, equivalent devices, give you all these same electrodes, so you have equivalent implants on all of these different subjects. Another one, because of the lightweight, any experiments where free behavior during recording is very important, um, these are gonna be a, a good option. Because they're so lightweight, there's not a ton of extra weight on the skull, um, there's a lot of like, pretty good natural behavior from mice and rats especially. So next, I wanna just run through like a, a few images of just really basic customization options that we've offered in the past. So the first one, this is probably like the most, one of the most common and one of the most basic that we offer is um, just clipping the bottom of the drive at an angle. If you're working in mice or rats and you're not like right dead center on top of Bregma, um, maybe you're over on the side of the skull or the back a little bit and you don't have nice flat real estate to drop a drive. We can clip that bottom at an angle so there's a little better interface with the skull. That's not a problem. It's super easy to do. And like I said, that's a very, very common request that we get. Another very common request is multiple electrodes on a single drive. So this is especially for mice where your real estate on top of the skull is a little more limited. Um, there can be a big advantage to having multiple drive or multiple probes ganged onto a single drive instead of trying to fit two drives in that space. So this one is kind of a little more streamlined than the, the single uh, D drive, just with the package holder and everything. It's meant to be as compact as possible. And these look like two 64 channels on here. Now it's worth noting on this that these electrodes don't have to be the same. Um, if there's like, two different layouts that you're looking at, maybe you want to have um, two different targets or two different types of recording on either side of the midline, the spacing between the electrodes can be adjusted and the electrodes themselves can be swapped out for whatever you need. They don't have to be the same length. You can be recording at different depths at the same time. 
and kind of on that note, another really common request that we get are like multiple independent electrodes on a single drive. So this is just like a real quick example of that. Again, here illustrating that the electrodes don't have to be the same. You can have eight shanks on one drive and a single shank on the other. You can be doing two millimeter recording depth on one and a 10 millimeter recording depth on the other. Um, these are all swapped out depending on what your needs are. And the spacing between the probes, the orientation of the probes themselves, this can all be customized depending on what you're looking for. Here's another example. This is a little bit different. So in this scenario, um, you would have multiple modular drives that are intended to be completely retracted and then swapped out, but they all share the same craniotomy. So that plate would be fixed in place with bone cement or bone screws. I think those four counterboard holes are actually four bone screws. Um, I believe this was originally intended for a marmoset. This was a proof of concept for a customer that um, this actually ended up kind of evolving into our P drive series. But uh, the big thing here is modularity. And again, if you want to have four independently depth adjustable, four repositionable micro drives with four different electrodes, this is an easy way to do it. Um, you could have a protective cap that sits over this whole thing. And like I said, they all share a single craniotomy, which makes your surgical planning a little bit easier. Another one, this is a little more complicated. Um, if you have specific target regions, like a, at a known distance from each other, if you want a specific orientation, you can see these two, pro these two probes are at 90 degrees to each other. And you want to drop in at specific insertion angles. Um, again, that's something we can offer. I know some people are very specific about not coming straight down through the cortex to preserve any like vertical connections through the top layers of the cortex. Um, again, that's a super easy thing for us to do. Even kind of going back to just a normal D drive with a clicked base, so that can be clicked at an angle. If you're trying not to come straight down through the cortex, something to think about. So, actually I should mention at this point, um, so they have a nice view of the screw on the bottom right. All of these micro drives share a pretty common architecture. Um, they all use like the same series of uh, custom miniature lead screws, and they all have a resolution of 150 microns per turn. So one full revolution of that hex screw on the top is going to be a depth increase of 150 microns. So this might be a little silly for um, <clears throat> small animal models, but this is just kind of to show what we can do. If you want like a, a one gram, sub one gram drive package, but you still want to do a recording that's three centimeters down, we can do that. Um, the only use case I can think of for something like this would, again, maybe be a marmoset, because um, they're not quite as rough in their equipment as some of the larger uh, non-human primates. But again, like this is kind of a, a hybridization of our, our vector series of electrodes, which are meant for deep brain recording and um, our disposable micro drives. So again, maybe not super realistic for this one, but this is really just to show like what we can do. Now on the flip side of that, like not all of these customizations need to be um, just like strictly our D drive series. You can change this out to be uh, any one of our optos can be customized. So our O drives. Um, this is an example of like, two independently adjustable optrodes. I'm not sure the distance on these, but again, like the distance, the orientation, all of this can be adjustable. Like we, we 3D print everything in house, so the um, the development timeline is really really accelerated. Um, I think I have another example of that. Yeah. So here's another example of a custom optrode. This is intended to be really streamlined, really compact. So this is actually two fibers on a single probe. Um, and I think Thor Labs sells compatible patch cords for this. So that's intended. You can see on the, on the very top left, that gray ferrule sticking out, there's actually two fiber channels running through there. 
So if you're doing optogenetics and you're doing um, like multiple opsins or you want to do um, stimulation and silencing at the same time, you can be pushing two different wavelengths down onto the same probe, or two different shanks on the same probe. So that really opens up a lot of cool possibilities if you're doing opto. So next would be just a few considerations um, if you're wanting to customize a micro drive with NeuroNexus. Now what I mean by this is um, if you want to move forward on a drive, these are going to be things that I'm going to ask you. So the first one is going to be the desired electrode and connector package. Um, I know I mentioned this briefly, but bigger connectors are not great for um, small animals, just for animal welfare reasons. The, the connector package, the, the size of the connector, the size of the head stage does add, add a lot of weight. And at the same time, the, um, the desired electrode layout that you have, the site layout, the spacing and everything, it might not be available on every shank length. There might be only a few options to choose from unless you want to order a custom electrode. So that kind of goes into the target depth as well. Um, I mean, if you have a site layout that's only available on a 10 millimeter electrode, but your, your target region is only five millimeters deep, that's something we need to know, we need to know about. Um, that's not a problem at all. And the reverse is not a problem as, all, as, as well. But again, it's just something we need to know about up front. Now those both, again, kind of play into the desired drive range. So let's say, for example, you have a 10 millimeter electrode and you want to put it on our most compact drive, which is a one millimeter drive, our, our D drive nano. That's fine, you can do that, but you'll have essentially a nine millimeter overhang from that one millimeter drive range. So you can do an implant and it's gonna be nine millimeters down and you can advance it another millimeter, but you won't be able to fully retract that probe out of the brain. You know, it's just something to think about when you're ordering this. Um, another one is gonna be probe orientation and angle. If you want like the, the surface normal of the electrode if you want the sites like facing the midline or facing forward or anything like that. Um, insertion angle, again, we can think back to that crazy drive with their uh, two probes at an angle. These are all things that some people don't care about. Some people have really specific wants and needs. Um, so again, um, if this is something that we can flesh out to make sure that we really fit your needs, that's why it's on the list. Weight limitations is, Another big one. Um, I know I briefly mentioned this, but for mice and rats, small animals in general, um, there is a limitation on package size, and that's purely just down to weight. The, the drive itself is fairly lightweight, but the, uh, the connector and the head stage can become pretty bulky and pretty heavy pretty quickly. So if you're trying to do any like freely recording animal recordings or uh, freely behaving animal recordings, you'll see more and more of an impact the more weight you put on top of a mouse or a rat. Um, there's gonna be less and less normal behavior when they start dragging this big tower around on the, on the ground. And again, this is probably like the biggest pet peeve of mine is space limitations. Um, it's a really awful feeling to design a, a drive, some like custom electrode system, and uh, assemble it in-house and like, have it sent out to a customer and like wait to see a publication come out on it only to have them email back and say, Oh, we forgot about this um, head bar or we forgot about this cannula here. Um, it's not going to fit on top of the skull. So please think of us as collaborators. Like if there's any information that you can share, please share it. Anything about your surgical protocol or your procedure, like other hardware that you're going to have on top of the skull please let us know because like I said, it's an awful feeling to spend a lot of time on this and then have a researcher be excited, go to implant it and say, oh wait, this isn't gonna fit. So just, if you have any other hardware on the skull, please let us know. So next up, um, the second half of this presentation is really gonna be about chambers. 
So this is probably a good opportunity for a, like a quick disclaimer. Um, I am not a medical doctor. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not advocating for like a specific surgical prep. Um, if you have like a strong preference for acrylic cement or bone screws or some other fixation methods, um, go with what you know best, go with what feels best to you. Um, this is really just to kind of explore what kind of, what kind of hardware is available in the space. So in this context, when we talk about a recording chamber, um, you can think of that as like a, like a doorway through the skull, something that you can open when you need access and close when you don't. If you have issues in the past with uh, like recording artifacts or not uh, motion artifacts rather, this is probably going to see where you see this crop up. If you need like a really rigid head fixation, uh, recording chambers are probably the way to go where you have something like rigidly fixed to the skull compared to like a separate frame that has a little bit of wobble to it. So these are just a few examples from literature. And actually, I think that bottom left one is one of ours um, in mice or rats. But this is really just to illustrate that this is not a one size fits all field. Um, everyone's running a different experiment. Every lab is different. They have different needs, different requirements. And the differences in their chambers will reflect that. Uh, so don't feel bad if you like, or don't, I should say, don't be scared away if you have an idea for a chamber or you think you need a chamber and you don't see anything like it on my screen in the next few minutes. Um, there are people asking for like really unique options all the time. So don't let it scare you away if you need something really unique. So I also want to go through a few pros and cons. Um, if you're thinking about going through up to, into large animal recordings, this is probably a good option for you, but there are a few downsides. So first, the good stuff. Um, you will get extremely rigid fixation for this compared to, like I said, having just like ear bars that are pretty repeatable. But if you have any movement artifacts, um, this will help clamp that down. Once it's rigidly fixed to the skull, the only relative motion you'll see is the, the relative motion between the brain and the skull itself. Another big benefit is they are resealable and reusable. So if you're doing like a long-term recording and you want to seal up that craniotomy and then walk away for a month, come back, open it back up and do another recording, that's where chambers are really great. Um, and reusable because they are usually made of like titanium or stainless alloy, they are definitely rugged enough to handle like use, repeated use on multiple animals. Design flexibility is a big one. So if you have, let's say you want to include a, a head post for fixation and slots for four micro drives internally and a slot for an optical cannula and another slot for a drug delivery port, these are all things that can be included in a single device. So because we have a ton of flexibility in-house with 3D printing and our machine shop, we have some pretty talented machinists on retainer. Um, there's a ton of flexibility where you can integrate all of that hardware into one device. So that really simplifies like the surgical procedure instead of having to do five separate implants, you can just do one and get all of those different mounting features, different registration features on a single platform. Next is the downsides. So like everything in this world, research in general is gonna be the cost because these are really kind of bespoke devices. They are gonna incur like a, some custom design costs. The next one that not a lot of people think about is gonna be imaging artifacts. Um, if you're doing imaging studies and you throw a big chunk of metal on top of the skull, like you will see artifacts from that. So not a huge concern for everyone, but if you're trying to do like an MRI study, you're not going to want to put a big piece of stainless steel on top of the skull. That's a big no-no. So again, if you're just getting into um, kind of the large animal space and you're wondering if this is right for you, I'm going to run through like some really common use cases for um, 
kind of commonalities between customers that find these things useful. Large animal models. So again, this is going to be non-human primates, swine, dogs, and cats. Um, like I said before, any any animal with a lot of neck strength, head strength to like really headbutt their hardware, or um, non-human primates in that case to be able to actually grab at or swipe at anything on the skull. This is where like the rugged nature and like a really rigid fixation of a skull chamber is going to be key to survive that kind of abuse. Next one is going to be, sounds kind of weird, but high value animals. So if you have an animal that's already undergone a ton of training, um, like years worth of training in some cases, or if you have an animal that's shared across multiple labs or shared by multiple teams, um, where they all might need some kind of platform to do multiple experiments. Maybe um, someone wants to do a recording one day and then someone else wants to do a recording two days later. Having that resealable craniotomy on there, having a resealable chamber, really shines for stuff like that. Mapping or imaging studies. Again, kind of for the same reason. Uh, if you want to do anything where your entire experiment is kind of holistically planned out um, in stereotaxic coordinates, this is a great example of that. So you can have a, uh, a chamber that has registration features or fiduciary features that you can look at in your imaging study, make sure everything's aligned, make sure you're on target, you know, the whole nine yards. If you want to have your entire experiment, the electrode, the chamber, and the skull, and the brain all on one screen <clears throat> in one scan, Chambers are a great option for that. And this one might seem kind of obvious, but intermittent or long-term experiments. So kind of by nature of being long-term, um, if there is ever a case where you think you're gonna do recording for a couple hours and then wanna close up your animal and then come back a day later or a week later and do recording for a few more hours and then repeat that process 20 times over the course of a month or six months or a year. Again, the reclosable nature of a chamber is key here. Um, once everything is healed up, uh, even with like titanium implants, once you start to get like some bone healing around the implant itself, that you can think of that as like a permanent fixture on the skull. So if you have long-term experiments going on, it's a good one to think about. So I want to run through a few basic chamber types, and these are really just uh, based on the way that, I guess you can think of, based on the way that the, the probe and the chamber itself interacts. So the first type is going to be definitely the most simple type, and that's going to be a um, where the chamber itself is not stereotactically registered, it just sits surface normal on the skull, and you're using a separate head frame to uh, do your insertion or to do your implantation. Really the only benefit you would get from something like a chamber like that is just having a resealable craniotomy to give you access to the brain when you need it. The next type would be something that is surface normal but is used as a, a stereotaxic register. Um, so your implant is gonna be aligned or implanted by some feature on the, uh, the chamber itself. So again, this is a, a common approach when you have um, a chamber that would go on a non-human primate and you can nest several micro drives inside that chamber. So the location of those electrodes is going to be set by the orientation of the chamber. Um, once, they're, like, once they're mounted in the chamber, you can drive them down to the tissue um, what you get is what you get. So that's a big one where surgical planning starts to become more important. And the third one, probably the most complex one, is um, kind of the same thing where the, uh, the implants are going to be registered to the axis of the chamber, but the entire device is fitted to the skull. So this is more important if you don't want to go straight down through tissue. Maybe there's some structure that you want to avoid um, or like a specific vector that you want to take. Uh, this is where things really start to play nice with imaging data. If you have access to MRI or CT, this can make our lives a lot easier for designing something like this. 
and again, this comes back to the whole thing, like holistically designing an experiment. If you want to really have everything planned out where you can see your chamber, the skull, all of the brain structures and the electrode all on one screen, all at the same time, walk through it with your team. That's the way to go. <clears throat> so I wanted to run through real quick just to give you guys like a, a sneak peek into our design process here in house. Just a really quick and dirty um, design of one of these chambers. So I know I mentioned this before, but if you have access to any kind of imaging setup, this would be the time to make use of it. Even if you have like a, a friend of a friend at a lab or there's an adjacent lab with some imaging equipment that you can borrow for an hour, um, definitely make use of it. It makes our lives a lot easier with the added benefit of having an implant that is really tailored to a single animal. So anyways, this is, um, I believe this is a CT of, this is Macaque, I'm trying to remember his name. That was Gandalf, I think. <laughs> um, anyways, we can pull skull data right out of that. Bam, there's the skull from Gandalf. And for this case, we're gonna use a really simplified Macaque model, <laughs> like hilariously simplified. But um, the point is, first things first, is we need some kind of skull geometry data. Next is gonna be craniotomy. So it's important to note that in this entire design process, there is gonna be a ton of back and forth with the surgical team. Um, unless you can supply us with like 3D data or fiduciaries if you're doing an imaging study to show us exactly where you want your implant located there's gonna be a lot of back and forth with the surgical team. Um, even something like this, like we might send you a vector and stereotypes of coordinates and say like, hey, this is what we're thinking. If this is the target that you're looking at, if this is the structure that you're going for, like this is the approach vector we recommend. Once we get, once we get their sign off, we um, perform our virtual craniotomy and go through the same process again. Have them take a look at it, everything looks good. We keep moving forward. Next thing would be to add any screw holes or fastening features. So in this case, these three green vectors are gonna be our screw holes. And again, the process repeats. We talk to our surgeon, talk to the surgical team, like if everything looks good, um, you finalize that step, move forward. Next is gonna be the implant and footprint. So again, process repeats. If you don't like getting emails from us, don't do a custom chamber because we are gonna be bugging you for approval about everything. We wanna make sure that this is like a perfectly fitted chamber, that it's exactly what you want, that we didn't miss anything, and that, like I said, that we've hashed out everything to deliver exactly what you need. And honestly, like that's most of the hard work. Once all of these variables have been established, like once the, um, the envelope has been established, uh, we can kind of sculpt something that fits in that envelope. Once the constraints are there, the sculpting to actually build this, this implant in virtual space, um, that's really the easy part. It's the back and forth and getting everything figured out, ironed out, and finalized. That's just, like I said, a lot of back and forth. And there's the finished product. I shouldn't say finished product. At this point, it's ready for 3D printing. Now at this point, for a chamber like that, we'll just use this one as an example. Um, it would go through a pretty typical workflow for construction. Oh, first things first, uh, for a macaque like that, it's probably gonna be 3D printed out of either a stainless steel alloy or a titanium alloy. So in this case, it would probably be DMLS, uh, which will give you a very high density centered metal part. And then after that, it's gonna go to a machine shop for any touch up machining. So DMLS is great for radical parts with weird geometries that are difficult to traditionally machine or radical alloys that are difficult to traditionally machine. But the big downside there is it doesn't leave you with a great surface finish. Um, it'll be kind of rough, like a, almost like a sandblasted finish, which is great for something like osseo integration, but not great for mating features like threads or a surface for a gasket. 
So we would 3D print um, this rough model, just shown in blue, and then threads on the inside of the cap, um, counter boards or counter sinks for the screw holes, those would be done at the machine shop after 3D printing. Next is gonna be material options. Now, there are a lot of options here depending on kind of what your needs are. Probably the most basic is gonna be like a standard A4 surgical steel. Um, it's gonna be relatively cheap, it's gonna be very rugged, it's gonna be very corrosion resistant. Kind of the big downside of that, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, but is <clears throat> if you're doing any kind of imaging studies, that's immediately a write-off or I should say if you're doing MRIs, it's immediately a write-off. Um, and it is not terribly lightweight. If you have a lot of other skull hardware already on, um, already on the head and you're starting to get nervous about weight, something like titanium might be a better option. It's gonna be more expensive, anywhere from 30 to 50% more expensive, but you're gonna save about that same percentage in weight. And it is, it's worth noting that it's just as corrosion resistant as something like a stainless steel. Now, both of these should be robust enough to handle any kind of um, like normal non-human primate activities, um, normal abuse, normal wear and tear, and should be rugged enough to handle reuse across multiple animals. So next we have a few options for biocompatible plastics. Um, Peak, which we can have 3D printed or machined, and Med 610, which we 3D print in-house with our, um, our high resolution printer. So like I said, those are both biocompatible. Um, they're worth considering if you are doing imaging studies and you really are trying to avoid any kind of artifacts. Um, it's worth noting there that, I mean, we have options for like peak bone screws or ceramic bone screws as well. So if you're really trying to stay away from any kind of metallic head fixture, head hardware, um, Peak and Med 610 are options there. There are also options if you're doing small animals. Um, so this isn't necessarily an approach that's only for large animals. I know one that I keep bringing up is the um, marmosets. So they are much more gentle on their hardware. And um, a lot of times you can get away with plastic instead of like all this heavy duty metal hardware. Or even I should say mice and rats, anything even smaller. I mean, if you need a reposable craniotomy, um, these are options. If you need something ultra lightweight, Med 610 is probably the best way to go. Now, it's also worth mentioning that <clears throat> Not all of these chambers require like this crazy 3D modeling, 3D printing workflow. Um, here's an example of one that's designed to be cemented in place, uh, just with a, like a really coarse knurl at the bottom to hold some cement. This can be churned out by the machine shop as is, uh, without any 3D modeling or anything. I know some researchers really prefer the bone cement approach because it gives you a little more flexibility when you go to do your implant. Maybe there's some vasculature in the way that you want to avoid with your electrode. So you can always shift it over a few millimeters before you really cement everything down. Um, whereas having something that's really custom, custom tailored to a single part of the skull, you might not have that same flexibility. So again, just something to think about. Uh, here's an example of another machine chamber with no 3D printing and like no 3D scanning. Um, no imaging data required. So this one is designed to use just bone screws instead of um, bone cement. You see like just the, the difference there. And again, any one of these is available in any of the materials that I have listed on the screen before. Uh, here's another option if you want to do like a couple probes side by side. Maybe you have two electrodes that you need to converge on a target uh, somewhere in the deep brain. Like, that's an option. Here's, yeah, here we go, here's a marmoset. Um, so this is a, uh, a 3D printed plastic chamber. I think this is Med 610. And uh, this is an example of our P drive. So this is our miniaturized primate drive for our miniaturized primate here. I think this is a pygmy marmoset, but don't quote me on that. So this is an, an example of how having a, um, like a really form-fitted chamber can lead you to like 
really rigid fixation. And here's kind of a, I wanted to end with like a, a pretty radical example here. Um, this was a kind of a proof of concept for a, uh, a customer about a year ago. Um, and he referred to it as a, a, a prosthetic cranium. So the idea is here that you would have multiple teams from a single lab all doing concurrent experiments on different parts of the brain, um, essentially sharing one animal with the same training. So if that's something that you're thinking about in your lab, maybe you're trying to save some money or maybe you have a, uh, a neighboring lab that wants to go in halvesies on a macaque, like this is, this is an option. Uh, recording chamber considerations. So again, just like the microdrive considerations, these are going to be things that I'm going to ask you if you want to move forward with a, a custom neuronexus microdrive or a custom neuronexus recording chamber in this in this situation. First one is going to be fixation methods. Um, do you want to use bone screws? Do you want to use acrylic cement? Are, are you okay with just a neural, or do you need a couple threaded feet? Do you want some combination of the two? Like there's um, a lot of different options out there. Next is going to be materials, and that totally depends on the experiment that you're performing, what kind of weight you can live with, especially if you have any other hardware on the skull, and if you're doing any imaging. Um, again, imaging artifacts, if you're trying to look at anything directly under this chamber and you have a metal chamber in the way, maybe not the right material. <laughs> uh, stereotaxic planning. So if you're if you're interested in imaging studies, if you have access to like pretty high resolution brain scans, if you have a target region that's only a couple cubic millimeters, this is something I would encourage. Um, make sure you have everything hashed out, like a, a chamber that's registered into your coordinate system uh, with registration or alignment features to make sure everything is aligned on the same vector to put you dead center on target. And Next one, I always hate this one, but it comes back on us so many times, is space on the skull. If you have other hardware on the, on the animal's skull that's taking up real estate, we need to know about it. Um, it. It's a really terrible feeling delivering something and having someone say, oh, this isn't gonna fit because of this pedestal here or something like that. So I would, I would encourage you to think of us as collaborators. Um, I mean, we have surgeons on staff. If you want to kind of hash out your surgical protocol with us, please share as much information as possible so we don't have any screw ups like this. And that's really all I got, man. If we got a few minutes for Q and A, um, I'll throw my contact info up there too. If you have any questions for me or anything, um, feel free to shoot me an email directly. Thanks a lot, Peter. That was great. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and end here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we'll see you all. Uh, look for our emails for our next uh, webinar next week. Thanks, Peter. Yep. Thanks, everybody.